yes, Lord, we thank you that you are the faithful one. And our hope is in you and you alone. So we thank you, Lord, for you are such a great and marvelous God. And it's the covenant-keeping God. So we thank you, we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. So this morning, we are continue our whole series. As we know, this year, we are going through the topical study and on the doctrinally, the Bible. So whole of this week, I trust you have been reading about covenant from Monday all the way to Saturday. You have, to get, you have been reading a covenant. So this morning, I'll entitle my message to be our covenant keeping God. I think there's a difference between contract and covenant. What is the difference between contract and covenant? Co covenant. A contract, the Oxford Dictionary describes it as an official written agreement. So it is an agreement between two different persons. Whereas the Cambridge Dictionary defines it as a legal document. Legal document is binding that states and, and explains the formal agreement between two different people or two different groups. So a contract is something you two persons agree or two parties agree and you sign on the dotted line. Okay, when one party decides to break, then the whole contract is out. For example, if you buy a house, you sign a contract and say within three months, you have to pay your earnest money. Within three months, you have to pay the, the uh, remaining. And if you do not do that, then the contract is out. So, but what is a covenant? A contract is an agreement, whereas a covenant is a pledge. A contract is two persons. I agree on this and you agree on this. If you break the contract, it is gone. Whereas a covenant is a pledge that we make to one another. You seal a covenant, put a seal there, whereas you just sign a contract on the dotted line. A contract is a mutually beneficial relationship, while a covenant is something that you fulfill. So in a covenant, even if one party breaks it, the other party can agree not to break it. K. Arthur. K. Arthur is the founder of the Precepts Ministries International. She is an excellent Bible teacher, and she designed the whole series of teaching about precepts upon precepts. And when she did, this is her best Bible study on Arthur, K. Arthur in Covenant. I think our ladies did it about four or five years ago. And she has this definition of covenant, which I thought was just excellent. He said, according to K. Arthur, a covenant is a solemn, binding agreement. It is solemn, no play play, and it is binding on both parties, solemn, binding agreement. This word covenant is used about 300 times in the Bible, okay? In the King James Version, it is at 272 times. Whereas in the New Testament, it's 20 times. Whereas in NIV Version, in the Old Testament, 263 times. Whereas in the New Testament, it's 33 times. And it is as K. Arthur said, which I like to borrow her definition, a covenant is a solemn binding agreement between God and man. In the Hebrew word for covenant and bereath, which is mean to bond together. It is like you who glue binding you together or to fetter together. Fetter means you use a chain to bind you together so you cannot go apart. There is a great term for covenant is just sintake or diatake means two parties join together. How many covenants are there in the Bible? If you were to do some research, some author, some Bible scholars say there are five covenants, some Bible scholars say there's six, some people say there are eight. I think in SSMC, we have put that there are six covenants. So Monday to Saturday, we did the sixth covenant. Even before we talk about the covenant, I would like to bring your attention that the Bible is only one book. The Bible is one book. And this Bible is the book 
is God's love letter to each and every one of us. It is a gift from God to all of us. And even as you read the Bible, it is not only one book, it is also only one story. Okay? And it is only one, there's only one storyline in the Bible, even though there are 66 books, and there's only one storyline. And if you were to read the Bible from the beginning to the end, it is a one complete storyline. Okay? It is one complete storyline from beginning to the end. And I would like to, even as I share this morning, I would like us to see that the Bible timeline that we have and the covenant that we're going to talk about is actually parallel. Okay, there are two types of covenant in the Bible. Okay, one is called the Suzerian Vessel Covenant. Okay, or we call it is a conditional covenant. Another covenant is called the Royal Grant Covenant. What is the difference between these two? The Suzerian Vessel Covenant is a covenant between two unequal partners. The Suzerian is the one that is more powerful, whereas the vessel is the less powerful. And the vessel, the less powerful one, must show submission to the Suzerian. So if they do not show submission, then the Suzerian will not bless them. It is like, if you obey me, if you submit to me, if you follow what I say, I will bless you. But if you do not, then I will not bless you. So it's a conditional covenant. Whereas the royal grand covenant is a, like the king granting a promise to his subjects. The subject does not need to do anything in return. So it is an unconditional covenant. So there are two types of covenant, and I'm going to show you from here. The first covenant we have is the Adam, Adamic covenant. When God created Adam, on the day six, God created Adam. And after God has created Adam, God created Eve. And he put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And let us read that together. Genesis 2, 15 to 17. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Then the Lord commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. So this is a condition. It is a covenant that God made with Adam and Eve. And also through Adam, he made with the whole creation that you are not to eat. If you eat, you will die. But as we read the scripture, here comes the, the Satan in the serpent, and he tempted Eve, and he tempted Adam, and they both ate. Eve at first gave it to the husband, they both ate, and they broke the covenant. And God has to punish them. And when they got punished them, in Genesis chapter 3, God cursed the man, God cursed the ground, God cursed Satan, and this serpent and God say at the end, he said in verse 15 of chapter 3, I will put enmity between you, the same serpent, and the woman, and between your offspring, the offspring of Satan, and hers, the offspring of the woman. He, the, the means the offspring of the woman, will crush your head and you will strike his heel. So that is the covenant Adamic covenant that God gave to Adam. And from this time onwards, from the time of Adam, all the way down to the end, it is actually God put in place a whole complete plan, progressive complete plan to restore man to himself. So we need to see when we read the scripture, it is story, 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 but it is one long overarching story of how God deal with man all the way. Then we have the Adamic covenant, and we know through Adam, different things happen, and when they come to the time of Noah, the Bible said that at the time of Noah, it was so evil, and then God, actually the Bible, God regretted, and God wanted to destroy everything and start new again. And so God 
make the next covenant, he God make the covenant with Noah, where he sank flood. Okay, and then after that, and then there were flood cover the whole earth, and everything died except eight persons: Noah, Noah's wife, Noah's three sons, and Noah's three daughters-in-law. So only eight persons, and all those animals that came in. If you read the scripture, if you read carefully the in Genesis 6, 7, 8, you find that actually Noah doesn't need to go around together. God said, God sent the two by two. Actually, it's God who sent the animal into the ark. And when the ark was closed, the door of the ark was closed, the flood came, and then it was there. At the end of it, there's the Noah. God made this covenant to Noah. Chapter 9, verse 8 to 11, And God said to Noah and to his sons with him, I now establish my covenant. This is the first time the word covenant is used. Maybe that's why some authors, some Bible scholars did not consider Adam's covenant as a covenant. That's how you come to five. Okay? I will establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you. I mean, whatever is inside the ark, the birds, the livestock, and all the wild animals. All those that came out of the ark with you, every living creature on every living creature, okay, and God said, Never again will all life be cut off by waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. So that is the Noahic covenant. And the sign, and God said in verses 12 and 13 of Genesis 11, and God said, This is the sign of the covenant. I have set my rainbows in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. A lot of time when we teach Sunday school, we will tell the children, whenever you see the, after rain, you see the rainbow in the sun, you remind that God has made the covenant, and God will not send the, send the rain again. But if you read the scripture carefully, actually what the scripture says, it is also a reminder to God that He will not send the rain. Okay? So that is the Noahic covenant. And then after Noah, only eight person survived and then they multiply again. And so then you went out of God, the Tower of Babel and so on. And then God chose a man. A man, Abraham. God chose Abraham from all the way of all the Chaldeans, and he gave him a covenant. It is God choosing Abraham, and God of his own initiative make the Abraham, make the covenant with Abraham. And the Abraham, Abraham made covenant and said, I will make you into the great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So that is the Abrahamic covenant. And then in verse, in chapter 15, God told Abraham outside and said, Look at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to them, So shall your offspring be. So that is the Abrahamic covenant that God made with Abraham. And then, so that, after that, from Abraham you have Isaac, Isaac you have Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, Joseph went to Egypt, and his family went to Egypt, and then of course they became slaves, and the Egyptians were ill-treated them, and they cried out to God, and God sent Moses. And Moses, we, we all know about the part, the Passover and the Red Sea, parting a Red Sea, and then they went into the promised land. And then that's where God has a covenant with Moses. We call Moses, Mosaic Covenant. And in this covenant, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, which is in Exodus chapter 19, verse 24. And verse 5 of Exodus chapter 19, so, now, if you obey me and keep me fully and keep my commandment, that out of all nations you'll be my treasured 
possession. So this is a conditional covenant. God said, you have to obey. If you obey, then you'll be blessed. And then of course, there, there's a moral law, the Ten Commandments, and the ceremonial law on all the sacrifices which you read in Leviticus. And then the, the condition of this covenant, if, if you read Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you obey, then you will have blessings. But if you disobey, you will have curses. So there's a mosaic covenant that I think we read on Wednesday. And then after that th come the time of judges. They went into the promised land. There come the time of judges. And after the time of judges, they wanted a king. So you have first your king Saul. Then after king Saul, you have king David. And after king David, you have king Solomon. There's a united kingdom. And when King David, when King David became king, and when he has his house established, he, he told Nathan the prophet, say, I have my kingdom is established, but God is still living in the tent. I want to build a house for God. So Nathan told him, okay, whatever you think is right, you go ahead and do it. But that night, the Bible said that night itself, God spoke to Nathan and asked Nathan to send this message to David. Okay? That is in 2 Samuel chapter 7. He said, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. David wanted to build a house for God. But God told him, no, you don't build for me. I, God, will establish the house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your father, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you. Ye, who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. So this is a covenant we call the Davidic covenant. A covenant that God made with David. Where he promised David that one day, one of your own sons or your own descendants will be king after you. So God promised David and Israel an everlasting kingdom. And he said, he promised that the king of this everlasting kingdom will come from the tribe of Judah, the house of David. And so we have now the Davidic kingdom. After King David, there's a divided kingdom. And of course, when we did the walk through the Old Testament, most of these kings were no good. And then in the year 722, the northern kingdom fell to the Assyria, and the southern kingdom fell to Babylon in 587, somewhere here. So both the, the kingdom fell, and then they, they went into exile for 70 years. And all this while, God's plan of salvation was still going on. You may not see it, the people may not see it, but God was at work. So they exiled, and then they came back, and then there was a 400 years of the, uh, silence here, where after Babylon, you have Middle Persian Empire, they have the Greek Empire and the, Rome, the Empire, Roman Empire. And then God established the new covenant. In Jeremiah chapter 31, shall we all stand and declare this? This is how God through the prophet Jeremiah establishes the new covenant. Please read it as a declaration. Okay, Jeremiah 31, chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after the time. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor, or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord because they will all know me, 
from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive the wickedness and remember their sins no more. So this is the new covenant that God establishes. And it is the covenant and fulfillment of all the previous covenants. And Jesus Christ is the mediator of this new covenant. Let's, I would like to point you to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. It reads like this. For this reason, Christ is the mediator of a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. Now that he has died as a ransom to set them free from the sins committed under the first covenant. Okay, let us just uh, quickly, briefly bring through why did we say that the new covenant is a culmination and fulfillment of all covenants. In the Adamic covenant that we read about right at the beginning, God made with Adam, it said that there will be a seed. The seed of the woman will bruise your head, will crush your head, whereas the seed of the serpent will bruise the, the feet. And this seed of the woman is fulfilled in Jesus Christ. In the no hate covenant, when I talk about salvation, where the ark was closed, they actually talk about Jesus and the salvation. Then the Abrahamic covenant, where God told Abraham, I will establish this covenant with you, and you will have your offspring will be all over the world, and people will be blessed. And this is established and fulfilled in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ came through Jesus, all, if all nations come to know Jesus, know the Jehovah God. In the Mosaic Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant talk about all the sacrifices. And as the book of Hebrew, when we read on the three years ago, we talk about the book of Hebrew. It talk about Jesus became the perfect sacrifice once for all. And so that all the sacrifices that were practiced in the, uh, the Old Testament, in Levitical system, need not pra be practiced anymore because Jesus himself died on the cross. His precious blood washed all of us and it is a perfect sacrifice. And of course, when we look about Davidic covenant, when God promised David that he will be a son, one of his own son from his line of David, the line of Judah, and that is fulfilled by Jesus because Jesus is from the line of David. So let us look at this. We talk about Adamic covenant, then Noahic covenant, Abrahamic covenant, Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, and New covenant. And on the bottom, I, those, all those that are colored in red are the, the conditional covenant. Whereas those are royal grand covenant, these are the non-conditional covenant. I have done this in a try to graphically to illustrate. You can look at it is something like going from big down to the center and then it go out. When you look at it, you find that actually it is a plan of salvation. Okay, right from the time of the Garden of Eden, God has sent this plan of salvation in place going through the whole Bible timeline, all that God had done through each and every covenant. It is, it is like centrally coming down. For example, the Adamic covenant, God made a covenant with the whole creation. When it comes to Noah, he, he, he make a, pick up the righteous eight because only eight people were righteous there. And then when he, when he chose Abraham, he chose a man and have a covenant with his offspring, so it becoming smaller. And then when he come to Mosaic, it become a, a nation. His covenant has come narrowed down to a nation. When he come to David, he become even narrower to one family, the David and his family. But when you come to the new covenant, when you come to the new, can you realize it spreads out again? All the time becoming narrow and narrow because spread because God has said this in John 3 16. God so loved the world that whoever believes, whoever believes, I wonder if any one of us 
seated here belongs to one of those whoever they have yet to believe. And I wonder whether any one of us have any of our family members, any of our loved ones, they are still in, included in the whoever. Whoever believes. I think today is a good day. If you, if you still belong to the whoever, take heart that the covenant-keeping God is here. And He wants the whoever, if you are part of the whoever, to be part of His kingdom. If you have friends, family members, they are still the whoever. Remember their name. Pray to the Lord that the, they, this whoever will believe in Him and be in the kingdom. Okay, let's look at what do we, after we talk about the five, six covenant, what lessons can we learn? What application can we learn? We, I repeat again what we say, the Bible is only one book. Even though there are 66, it's a library of one book. Okay, and there's only one storyline, the storyline of how God dealt with man. Since the Garden of Eden, how God dealt with it all the way down with only one purpose that he, he wants man to be reconciled to him. And it is fulfilled when Jesus, death and resurrection, the birth, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So that is the one story. Okay, and the Bible timeline of the covenant is parallel. Hebrews 13 verse 8 says this, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. He is the same. So we have to be sure, certain in the heart, that God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament is the one and same God. Some people will think that God of the Old Testament is a very cruel God. He better. God of the New Testament, the New Testament God is the God of the... No. It is the same God because it's the same covenant keeping God. Right from Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, it is the same God. So I have three, just three points of application. Firstly, God, our God that we worship. He is our covenant keeping God. Covenant keeping God. Second lesson. Which some of us have you? Yes, He is the covenant keeping God. What if I blew it? What will happen? Thirdly, this is the part that I had to struggle a lot within myself. How do I make sense of God's covenant? I think, I think as we all preachers, maybe some people, I will take weeks maybe one, two months to start reading on the passages. But over the last one week, the first half of the week, my mind was just stuck on this. How do I make sense of God's covenant? And I had, I had to and seek the Lord and seek an answer before I can share it with you. Okay, our covenant keeping God. Firstly, take note that it is God Himself that initiates the covenant. He is the one who initiates a covenant with man. And secondly, it is God's choice of whom he made the covenant with is not on merit, but on grace. Of course, the only one may be in Noah's hate covenant. When God saw it is so wicked, he made covenant with Noah because he is the righteous man, as the Bible says. But all the other covenant, if you look at it, God choose, initiates the covenant with somebody, not because how good the person is. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, 7 to 9, this is in Deuteronomy, is the, they say the second law, when Moses really treated and the whole law to the people of Israel. And he told them that, that you were the least and the fewest of the people. He said that 
the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than other people. For you were the fewest of all people. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to his forefather that he brought you up with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, that's Egypt, from power of Pharaoh the king. Okay, so this is that God chose the Israelites, not because there were many, but because they were the fewest of all the people. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 8 to 11, this is about the Davidic covenant. When David wanted to build a house for the Lord, but God said, no, you don't build a house for me. I build a house for you. And that is what he said through the prophet Nathan. God told this to David. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be the ruler over my people Israel. So David is actually a shepherd boy, the youngest of all the brothers. But God chose him, even though from the field, to be a king. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 26 to 30, this is, this is where Paul wrote to Paul wrote to the people in the Corinth. He said this, Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. That means before we became Christian, how did God call us? Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things they are not to nullify the things they are. So even as we look at us, even look at myself, am I worthy enough? Am I so good that God chose me? No. God chose me is totally because of His grace, and His grace alone. The first one, our covenant-keeping God. Okay? Then the third point, God's solemn binding agreement, as K. Arthur say, A covenant is a solemn binding agreement that God made with His people. And we know because in the book of Numbers, it says, God is not a man that He should lie. So when God has made a covenant, he will not lie. He'll be faithful. And 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, this is what Paul said, for no matter how many promises God has made, there are yes in Christ. So we are, our God is a covenant-keeping God. The fourth point, God is faithful even if we are faithless. Okay, in 2 Timothy 2.13, he said, God remains faithful even when we are faithless. In Isaiah chapter 49, verse 15, this one say, he said, even if your mother may forget you, but God said, I will not forget you. I think those of us who are with our mothers will understand, no matter what it is with our children, the children are always dear to us. But God, even if as the mother, I forget my children, but yet God will not forget it. Or get them. Okay, the second point I want to talk about. Sometimes we ask, what if I blew it? What if I blew it? God is faithful, but what if I blew it? Sometimes people will say, told us that I'm not good enough. When we share Christ with some people, I say, wait, 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 wait. Wait till I'm good first. I'm not good enough to be a Christian. Wait, wait. Give me some time. I want to be good first. Or some of them say, I'm too far gone. Or some of them say, what do I do? Even though I have trusted in Jesus, but I fall in the sin again and again. Remember, my dear brothers and sisters, a covenant that God made with us does not depend on us. It depends on God. And He is the faithful God. He is the covenant-keeping God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that we read just now, not many of us are wise, influential, noble birth. And yet, God chose us. 
So there's no one that is beneath, below, beyond what God can touch. The Apostle Paul persecuted the Christians. He said in his book, of, I'm the greatest of all sinners, and yet God chose him. We have heard about testimony, how people were death row. But how they, the Lord called them and they became Christian. And then in 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. And verse 1, verse 9 says, if we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just and He will forgive us, forgive our sins and purify us for all unrighteousness. So brothers and sisters, never think that you are beyond God's covenant. Never think that you are outside the reach of God's covenant. And never think that just because you have bungled it, you have blew it, God cannot redeem you back. We must always remember there's a transforming power of the Holy Spirit that will help us. Making sense of God's covenant. How do I make sense of whether our personal or our national or global calamity? Some of the areas that we struggle with, sicknesses, whether our own sickness or the sickness of our loved ones. I lost my mother to cancer when I was just 17. And I lost my father also to cancer when I was just 25. So making sense of sicknesses is something that is, I had to come to terms with it. Even right now, I can na name four individuals that I love dearly. They are very, very close to my heart. They are all undergoing chemo treatment for cancer. I covenant to stand with them. And I'm sure many of us, either your own loved ones or your close ones, you either have lost someone to serious illness or you have somebody who is struggling with that. How do I make sense of God's covenant? Religious persecution and missing persons. This is so dear, so close to home in Malaysia. Today is the 2nd, February 2nd. It's just 11 days time. On February the 13th, we are going to remember there's a third anniversary where Pastor Raymond Kaur was abducted. Three years. So it's something close to our heart. And I think the Suhakam inquiry for the missing of Hilmi and his wife Ruth will start on February the 18th within this month. So how do I make sense? God, my God, is the covenant-keeping God. Islamic extremism. And if you were to subscribe to whether Barnabas find prayer letter or Ma Voice of the Martyr prayer letter, you'll be every time you will read about extremism in the Middle East, in Africa, where whole villages were just massacred by the extremists. How do I make sense of that? The Australian bush, I think there are some people who have uh, settled down in Australia and they are back here. We yeah, want to say welcome to you. And by September 2019, until now, the Australian is still, the bushfire is still there. And they said they have about 27 million acres in the country have burned. 29 people have died and 1.25 million animals have been lost. Of course, in volcano in Philippines, that was just this year. Of course, now, all everybody is talking about Wuhan coronavirus. Okay, it started late December and it's escalating. The latest number that we got this morning was 200 pe 259 people have died as of last night and infected about 12,000 people and it spread to many countries. Okay, so it is something that we struggle with. But I was quite interested, uh, interesting to note that 
our health minister say this Mis misinformation about the virus has become so pervasive that Malaysia's health minister warned that it is more critical issue than the disease itself. So our encouragement to you is as a church, we were not, we did not stand, some, church, some churches stand up, pastoral letter, don't shake hand. Now. I will still shake your hand. <laughs> It'd be crazy if you come to church and don't shake hands, right? Okay. Or, but I think we just need to take reasonable care. Okay. Personal hygiene, keep from, uh, keep from crowded places. I think pastors stand up if you have flu and so on, go to designated hospital. Okay. And I would encourage and I would say, please, please do not quickly forward every email, every video that you send, especially those very sensational ones. A lot of them is half truth, a lot of them are fake news fear-mongering. So I think we have to be careful of that. Okay, how do we make sense of national calamity? Something we need to think about. First, we are in a fallen world. And because we are in the fallen world, disaster will happen. Sicknesses will happen. This will happen in a fallen world. And then God always has a reason and a purpose for any suffering that He allows. Thirdly, and then a lot of time God allows suffering to perfect you, to change you. And God, some, a lot of time, allows suffering so you can be a testimony to others. And sometimes God allows suffering to continue to fulfill a plan that is beyond your understanding. I think I shared the story about my two good friends and a couple of years ago at one of my sermon, and I sought the permission again to share this. I think a lot of us know them, the Luke family and the Bues family. Sometimes we hear of people, incidences of people who because they lost a child, they become so angry and they went out of the church and never come back again. I'm sure you have heard such story. People are so disappointed, disillusioned with what they think God didn't answer the prayer and they left not only the church but they left God but these two good friends of ours they went through challenging time one of them have a two year old daughter that was in ICU for about close to one and a half months and at different times different one, one of us were worried whether we are going to keep her and today she is a pretty young lady graduated working another the boys they have a pair of lovely twins all of us went to their house for full moon and all of us went home very happy rejoicing Satukali dua anak beat so many of us but the next morning early in the morning we got a phone call that the baby died in her sleep one of the twins that phone call is so imprinted in my heart and when we came to church that morning, it was my team, Team A, where Mrs. Boy was one of our team member. So she, obviously she couldn't come. And when we come together, we have people like Jamna, May, Sue, the group of us. When we met each other, we just harder and cry and cry and cry. How do you, how can you express your pain and sorrow? When the night before, we were celebrating their full moon and the early morning the next day, she's gone. But when I know these two friends, I know them, the girls are 27, same age as Unhui. So I knew them for 30 years. Both of these friends, we knew them, we grew up together, we grow, we, 
we met when we came down from Lippis, they were in our cell group and so on. And I can tell you how they responded to that tragedy in their life and how their own concept, their own understanding of God and their own commitment to ministries, their own increased love for others, how it was so different. And I'm wondering, what was it that made the difference? Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 5 says this. Jeremiah said, If you have raised with men on foot and they have worn you out, how can you compete with horses? If you stumble in safe country, how will you manage in the thickest by the Jordan? And so, brothers and sisters, God is the covenant-keeping God. But that does not mean that we are spared from challenges, from calamity. And I would like to aim with this. How do I prepare myself to face these challenges? Three things. Know God. Know God intimately. So it will be something, it is like the covenant. It is like you're fettered together. You are bound together. Your relationship with God is so close. And know His word. And that's why for the last couple of years, this is the fourth year we are doing being with Jesus. Know His word. If I do not know God's word, I will not know intimately the God of this word. And then be far-sighted. If you look at people who were there when they were when the Moses and so on, did they see what was coming in the end? No, be far-sighted. And when we talk about covenant, new covenant, but we want to look beyond that. That is where Jesus came on the first time. But know that Jesus will come again. And when you look at the book of Revelation, one message, Jesus wins. So whatever challenges I face, we face now, we can keep in mind the final thing, Jesus wins. And because Jesus wins, we are victorious. Like Edward prayed, we shall pray, we shall intercede from a point of victory. Okay. This is a song that we used to sing when we were youth, right? And I see smiling. The young people probably don't. Okay. So I want Unyao to sing this song meditatively and you just listen. You see, God has not promised. Skies always blue. Flowers thrown pathway. All our lives true. God has not promised sun without rain, joy without sorrow, peace without pain. But God had promised strength for the day, rest for the labor, light for the way, grace for the trials, help from above, unfailing kindness, and dying love. Over to you, Uniao. God has not promised skies all
sisters I do not know what you are going through in your life right now so even as we end I want to open this for ministry three things we talk about God is our covenant keeping God what if I blew it and how do I make sense of God's covenant so we will open this for ministry and pass the time to pastor and if you need someone to pray with you, whether you find that you are not good enough for God, or you find that there's thing you struggle with, or you find that you find it so difficult to make sense of God's covenant, and you need someone to stand with you and pray for you, 